of the mighty rushing wind and it's closer now than it's ever been I can almost hear the trumpet it's Gabriel's Sounds the call, and at the midnight cry, we'll be going home when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children. Show up. see fulfilling and the signs of the times they're appearing everywhere I can almost hear the father your children and at the midnight cry the bride of Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children shall rise to meet him in the air and then those that remain will be quickly changed and at the midnight Jesus comes Grab our Bibles this morning, if we would, 
Turn them with me to Ecclesiastes chapter number three as we continue our study. We've entitled it Never Enough. We're looking through this book of scripture known as Ecclesiastes. We're hearing from the expert of life, the one who has experienced and dealt with and built and had about everything you would want to have in life. And now he's giving his commentary on it in the context of it being detached from God under the sun. And all things, no matter how splendid they might be, if they are detached from God, cannot find their complete depth of meaning and purpose. In fact, he comes away from the experience letting us know that life under the sun, detached from God, is empty, it's meaningless, it is vanity. And so we've looked at this from various different levels. And today we're gonna look at the fact that there is never enough justice. Never enough justice. So let's together uh, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter number three. And we're gonna begin reading with verse number 16 this morning. If you found your place there and you're physically able to stand, let's stand together out of respect for the reading of the word of God. Ecclesiastes 3 We'll begin here in verse 16. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them that they might see that they be themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again." Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Wherefore, I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun and behold the tears of such as were oppressed. And they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore, I praised the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, I, yea better is he than both they, which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Let's pray this morning and ask the Holy Spirit of God to help us. As we dig into this passage of scripture, Lord, we come before you very humbly, understanding how easy it is for our mind and our heart to be enamored with just the things that exist in this world. It's very easy for us to idolize these things, to in many ways make even these concepts or principles our God, instead of looking to you who is the author and finisher, the alpha and the omega, the giver of all life. I pray this morning that we would very clearly see ourselves in the pages of Scripture. Many of us are are overwhelmed, are overcome with the understanding and the feeling that there is not perfect justice in this world. Many times we're angry and we're frustrated with that. We're compelled to act in the flesh and to bristle and to harden our hearts and to not recognize your sovereign work even in those things that might seem unjust to us. So this morning, I pray that you would teach us how to walk in a broken and sinful world and still recognize your hand in our lives. I pray that the things that we do, the affections that we have would be firmly attached to that which is above heaven and not that which is under heaven. May we be able to enjoy the work that we do in light of your eternity and not despise the work that we do in light of the world passing away. So Lord, freshen us this morning, work in our hearts, bring us to a place where we clearly see you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, 
Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This morning, we're taking a look at the fact that under the sun, in this world, there is never enough justice. And I think we all can connect with that point. We all recognize that in this sinful, broken world, things do not turn out in the justice that we would picture them turning out in. That life in this world is many times not what we would consider fair. Now we understand that God, in his calling upon man, in his calling upon the crowning cap of his creation, man, he calls us to exercise justice. The Bible tells us that we should walk humbly before our God, that we should exercise justice. We understand that God has ordained the powers that be to exercise justice in our world. And yet we come away with the knowledge of all of that, still seeing that justice many times is very poorly worked out under heaven in our world today. And so the author here of Ecclesiastes examines this issue of never enough justice. As we dig into this this morning, I want us, first of all, to recognize his evaluation of the places of justice, the places of justice. Notice with me, if you would, again, in verse number 16, the author writes, and moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. We have places in our world, we have places in our culture that are known as the halls of justice. We have courthouses, we have people who represent populations that go and legislate various different forms of law for the citizenry to abide by and be held accountable to. And we look upon those, those different places with a certain amount of of respect and awe. We, we look to these places to answer questions concerning judgment and righteousness and justice for us. In fact, many times when you go near a courthouse or in a courthouse, you'll find it adorned with various artwork depicting our value of justice in our world. Many times you'll go to a courthouse and outside the courthouse, you'll see a statue of a lady and she's holding a balance or scale in her hand, saying that this is a place where justice will be weighed out and met and measured and delivered. That statue has a blindfold on her, symbolizing the fact that justice is blind. And, and while these principles are good and while these principles are worthy, we know that we live in a sinful, broken, lost world. And how many of you know that justice, in fact, is not blind? That many times justice is seen through the eyes of people who are not attached to God, who mete out justice based upon the carnality of their own heart and not the righteousness and holiness of an all-just God. And in a sense, this is what our author is fleshing out for us this morning. If we are counting on our life having meaning, if we are counting on our life having purpose, if we are counting on our life meaning something outside of just the vanities that exist in our heart, that justice under the sun will not be a satisfactory God in our life. It will not conduct itself well without God that justice in this world is in fact broken and many times unreliable. Now I'm glad for the country that we live in. I'm glad that in its inception, the foundations of our country attached themselves to principles that came from God's word. In fact, our country for centuries now has been the envy of many other nations concerning the justice system that has been provided to us, concerning the ways our laws are passed, concerning how its people are represented. But can I tell you, in and through all of that, there have still been wicked people who have been detached from God, who have blurred and marred and convoluted the process of justice, even in the United States of America. Justice under the sun 
is not going to be perfect. And we find this given to us by the examiner of life, the author of the book of Ecclesiastes. Notice what he says again in verse number 16. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, the place where justice is meted out, and that wickedness was there. How many of you understand there's wickedness in the hearts of people all over the world today that are exercising judgment? We have dictators and despots. We have tyrants who rise to power and in their form of ruling over people, they meet out a judgment and a justice that does not benefit the culture and society, but benefits themselves. We have elite classes in the world today that are beginning to exercise forms of tyranny over populations. I believe, and I fear this even in our own country, we have people who are trying to abolish and remove the the veneration of justice in our country today and trying to usurp themselves and their ideology above that even which our country was founded on. Hey, such is the case of a sinful world and by the way, America is not immune to it. Throughout millennia, the world has seen people come and go from the places and seats of justice and we've seen an imperfect exercise of justice. Many times this bends our heart and mind out of shape. We get frustrated. How many of you get frustrated when you see injustices? I get frustrated. I remember learning this at a young age. I remember in the Christian school I went to when I was eight years old, we had a time of testing every year. And we would go through our different subjects and we would take exams in these subjects. And I remember on one testing day, we went to the testing center in our church building and we sat around the testing table and they'd place the students, oh, at a decent, you know, gap away from each other around the table. And we would sit there and we'd take our tests and the teacher would sit at her desk and kind of evaluate what was going on. And there was one monitor who would walk around the room and just make sure that everything was going smoothly. And I remember we were about halfway through our testing And the boy to the right of me had already completed his test. He was one of the smart guys, all right? And so he'd completed his test and because he was bored and waiting for everybody else to finish up, he began to just draw some pictures along the edges of his test paper, kind of doodling out just some things that were in his mind. And he thought he had doodled out something that was worth examination. And so he took his test paper and he slid it across the table toward me. And just out of natural response, when something's being slid across the table in your direction, I glanced down at the paper to see what was being slid toward me. And as soon as I glanced down at the paper, I looked up and my eyes locked with the monitor in the room. And she looks at me and I look at the paper and she says, what are you doing, Brian? And I'm like, I want to take the fifth, right? (laughs) I knew anything I said at that point was just going to make it look worse to me. And so I, I told her, hey, listen, I was just looking down at this paper. And she said, hey, are you cheating? I said, no, I'm not cheating. He just slid the paper over and looked down at it. Hey, are you supposed to be looking at other people's paper? No, I, I know I'm not supposed to be looking at other. Hey, we're going to go. I was in the principal's office. <laughs> Sitting across from him, the monitor in the room. And he begins to ask me the same questions the monitor asked me. Brian, what were you doing? I, I wanted to say, you know what I was doing. It's why I'm in the room. He said, same question the teacher asked me, the monitor asked me. Uh, were you supposed to be looking at other people's papers? To which I tried to argue and I tried to plead my case. But how many of you understand, in a situation like that, the more you start to whine and complain, the more you just sound guiltier and guiltier. And what was taking place there? What was taking place is the justice that comes from our own viewpoint, our own vantage point, our own heart, and our own experiences. And typically, if you walk into any room and you have two kids comparing notes on a test paper, what are they doing? Cheating. Cheating. But I wasn't cheating. I would just, my, my eyes were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the principal didn't see it that way. And the monitor didn't see it that way. 
And so the principal told me this, and I think, I think he even made this motion when he did it. He said, Brian, something's gonna have to be done about this. I'm like, are you gonna hit me? He said, Brian, you're gonna have to go without your recess for the rest of the day today, you get no recess. Now, what I noticed is the boy who slid the paper to me, he wasn't in the principal's office. The boy who wanted to show me his fancy artwork, he wasn't having his playtime removed from him. So I sit there at my desk watching all the other kids play, thinking to myself about the injustice <laughs> that's just happened to me. Stewing over it, becoming embittered about it, thinking how I'm going to get this monitor back by putting a lizard in her backpack or something. <laughs> I'm just stewing on this and stewing on this. You can tell it made an impact. I'm 44 years old. I'm still thinking about it today. <laughs> and this is what I've come to learn since that time. This is what I've come to learn. Life isn't what? Life isn't fair. Justice is not perfectly met out under the sun. And no matter what halls we construct, no matter what robes we wear, no matter how much study we've done, we can be a people who can be responsible to follow God's callings and do the best that we can. And some people get it better than others as they're attached to the principles and verses and scriptures from God's word and his intentions and callings. But under the sun, we have imperfect knowledge. Under the sun, we have imperfect experience. Under the sun, we have imperfect wisdom detached from God justice will never be perfect and it doesn't matter the places or the halls that it's conducted in it will never be perfect he examines the places of justice and he finds that the place of judgment wickedness is there and in the place of righteousness sin or iniquity is there we tend to see things through our own sinful eyes, experiences, and heart. And how many of you understand our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? Who can know it? So he examines the places of justice. Next, he examines the people of justice. He examines the people of justice. Notice with me, if you would, verse number 17. I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in mine heart concerning the estate, the condition, the position of the sons of men that God might manifest them and they might see that they themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? What is the author saying here? The author is saying that concerning the people of justice, if we are detached from God, if we are detached from his sovereignty, if we are detached from his holiness, if we are detached from his justice and judgment, if we are detached from who he is, then it relegates us to be like the beasts. It relegates us to be like the animals. In the animal kingdom, the justice of God is not observed and exercised. In the animal kingdom, they go by one law, and it's the law of the jungle. How many of you have ever heard of the law of the jungle before? When you enter into it, you become part of it. That's why I don't like getting in the ocean. I don't like entering the food chain on a real level. <laughs> right? And detached from God, detached from an understanding of his righteousness, holiness, wisdom, and judgment, detached from his truth, men tend to behave like animals following the impulses of their heart instead of following the truths of God's law. God's law is embedded on the heart of man. We have a conscience, but when we sear that conscience, when we cut ourselves off from God, 
we become very animalistic in our approach to carrying out our views and our laws and our judgment and our justice. We find that we view our justice through our own eyes, through our own paradigm, through our own view of that which is right. In fact, the Bible speaks to the chaos that ensues when men do that which is right in their own eyes. We become like the animal world. And one thing happens to them all. They live, they do the best they can, they fight for survival, they live a mere existence, and then they go into the ground and they become dust. And that's what it's like in a world that hungers after justice but can't find it because they're detached from God. And even justice at that point in time doesn't make sense because it's convoluted and twisted around our own evil minds and our own evil hearts and it's meted out in inconsistent ways. 